In the summer of 1989, President Bush announced the Space Exploration Initiative, directing NASA to draw up long-term plans to get humans back to the moon and begin developing a program of manned Mars exploration. At Martin Marietta, Zubrin and his colleagues looked forward to igniting NASA's space program after two decades in low Earth orbit. Of course, we were very excited when Bush made his call saying that he was making a national commitment to implement such a program. NASA assembled a large team to take on the space initiative. In 90 days, the team developed a 30-year plan that required an enormous build-up of space infrastructure. What the NASA bureaucracy decided to do was basically uh, design the most complex mission they possibly could in order to make sure that everyone's pet technology would remain mission critical, which is the exact opposite of the correct way to do engineering. First, NASA would triple the size of the planned space station and add enormous hangars, as well as free-floating fuel depots and crew stations. In space, they would build ships that could travel on to the moon. Then, on the moon, they would construct more shipbuilding facilities, bases and depots. Next, the moon crew would construct the Mars ship, a huge craft dubbed by its detractors as Battlestar Galactica. The ship would carry everything to Mars over an 18-month flight, descend to the surface, spend a few days there, then plant a flag in the ground and go home. The plan became known as the 90-day report. To those of us at Martin who had been engaged in designing Mars missions, when they saw the monstrosity of complexity of the 90-day report, we were dismayed and it was readily apparent to anyone with any insight that that program would fail politically. The plan was submitted to Congress. The estimated cost $450 billion. The legislators went into shock. This would have been the single most expensive program for the United States since World War II. By the end of 1990, Congress had refused all requests for funding. When the realization came that the project was doomed, Zubrin wrote a memo to his colleagues at Martin Marietta, outlining his problems with the NASA plan and arguing for a more direct approach. Zubrin favored launching a Mars mission directly from the surface of Earth, using only existing rocket technology. This negated the need for a lunar base and avoided the complexity and cost of building ships in space. He also objected to NASA's plan for a short surface stay on Mars, a mission that would amount to little more than a flag and footprint exercise. To Zubrin, we were going to Mars to explore and develop a new world. To maximize surface time, Zubrin proposed using a faster flight path known as a conjunction class mission. This would mean a crew could arrive on Mars after only a six-month journey. They would then remain on the Martian surface for a year and a half. This would give the team time to explore a wide area and conduct detailed research about the planet. Then, as the Earth return window opened, the crew would launch from Mars for a six-month trip home. Along with several like-minded colleagues, Zubrin decided to ask management at Martin to allow them to design alternative Mars missions. The management approved that, and we formed a team that was known as the Scenario Development Team of just 12 people from the whole very large Martin company. There was one team member whose thinking was closely aligned with Zubrin's. I went off to my office and said, all right, how would I do a Mars mission if I had to pay for it and I had to go on the ride? And I said, well, it's going to be simple. There's going to be no on-orbit assembly. I really tried to take everything out of the mission that didn't absolutely need to be there. While the rest of the team focused on longer-term, more traditional mission plans that required on-orbit assembly, Zubrin and Baker decided to collaborate on a mission with a quicker turnaround. We decided to do Mars the way Lewis and Clark did America. Okay. Use local resources, travel light, live off the land. Zubrin and Baker were convinced that a Mars mission could be launched directly from the ground. The other team members felt this was impossible, that the weight of the rocket fuel required for a round trip to Mars was so enormous it would render the launch ship impossibly heavy. 
To solve this problem, Zubrin was exploring a radical idea that had been kicked around the aerospace industry since the mid-1970s. The idea was to produce a methane oxygen rocket fuel directly from the Martian atmosphere. It was a robust chemical engineering procedure from the 1800s, the era of the gaslight. If the idea worked, astronauts could land a relatively light ship with empty tanks. They wouldn't have to ship all the fuel with them for their return trip. The only problem was methane oxygen fuel requires a hydrogen component. Hydrogen exists on Mars in the form of H2O, but water may be difficult or impossible to extract from the Martian environment. Really, the hydrogen was only 5% of the total weight of the methane oxygen propellant being manufactured. So if you just say, okay, we won't be pure, we won't get all of the propellant from Mars, we'll just get 95% of the propellant from Mars. The other 5%, the hydrogen, we'll just bring from Earth. But their proposed spaceship was still too heavy. Then Zubrin had a brainwave. Well, one of the key events of the Mars Direct Development was one morning Bob burst in my office and said, I've got it. The idea that I finally hit on in 1989 was that we would split the mission up into two parts and we'd send the return vehicle out first with its own return propellant plant. So the propellant would be made on Mars before the first astronauts ever left Earth. With two separate direct-to-Mars launches, a human crew would have a fully fueled ship waiting for them on the surface of Mars before they had even left Earth. So Zubrin and Baker had come up with a plan that seemed to accomplish all of their goals. It was relatively inexpensive, development time was short, they could use existing technology, and it allowed for a long stay on the Martian surface. They dubbed their idea Mars Direct. Four, three, two, one, engine start. Once upon a time in the not too distant future. Carrying the most skillfully assembled flight team in history, four astronauts begin their two-year mission to the Red Planet. This will be the first time a human has gone beyond the Earth-Moon system, 400 million kilometers further than any person has ever been. to the health problems of zero gravity and enable the astronauts to fully acclimatize to the conditions on Mars, the ship will deploy a weighted tether attached to the last stage of the spent rocket booster. By thrusting the ship into a rotational spin, the counterweight of the rocket will create centrifugal force and thus artificial gravity. The crew will be able to live with their feet planted firmly on the floor during their six-month transit. Already on the surface sits the Earth Return Vehicle, or ERV. For six months, its chemical plant has produced the methane oxygen rocket fuel for the launch home. For more than 500 days, the astronauts will live on Mars and embark on one of the greatest journeys of discovery in the history of science. Will they find life? or the fossilized remains of past life. Such a discovery could tell us whether our solar system has seen more than one genesis and answer the ultimate question, are we alone? In any case, these explorers will be learning how feasible the colonization of Mars really is.
Then, when the time comes and the window for Earth return opens, the crew will climb into their vehicle and head home. What began as a trickle will rise into a deluge of humankind, sweeping over a once barren land and transforming it into a viable new world. Well, that was the plan.